Jonathan, it's a delight to welcome you to the Coronavirus Multispecies Reading Group. Thank you for sharing these, these two um, really interesting papers. Um, you've got one in, in science um, talking about the timing of, of the SARS-CoV-2 index case. Um, and, and you've got another preprint that, that you've also shared where you're uh, going into the um, details of, of some of these, these different genomes and, and lineages of, of SARS-CoV-2. Um, to, to give people a little background for understanding um, this idea that you're dealing with computationally, um, the most recent common ancestor, I, I thought it might be interesting to start with another virus, HIV, um, so in your science paper, you talk about molecular clock phylogenies and um, two different moments that we now understand um, from HIV. So it, it appears that um, the HIV virus um, crossed from the chimpanzee um, uh, reservoir to, to humans in Southeast Cameroon. And then later in the early 20th century, as, as Kinshasa urbanized in what's now the Democratic Republic of Congo, you know, that's, that's where um, it seems like uh, HIV really became the virus that, that it is today and became something that, that spread in, uh, in global networks and, and um, became what some call a pandemic. Um, so maybe if you could just revisit that HIV case and, and kind of explain those two different moments in history, but also, you know, some of the assumptions and the mathematical models that people are using um, to calculate the most recent common ancestor um, both in HIV and now in, in SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, so first, thanks for having me. And one of the main factors of a lot of the models that we use is that it relies on sequencing data. And it we can only build a model with the sequencing data that we have. And so whether it's like HIV or SARS-CoV-2, the furthest back in time we can go is purely dependent on the relationships among those sequences. And so if those sequences all converge to some most recent common ancestor dating of, you know, let's say a few years ago, or I mean, in our case, like a year and a half ago, or for HIV um, in the, you know, mid-ish 1900s, um, that's as far back as we can go with those sequences. But there are other ways you can possibly infer an even earlier date. And that could be a mathematical model or that could be other kinds of data. And so like with HIV, um, one of the papers that we reference in uh, the index case paper that we're going to talk about today uh, talks about chimpanzee reservoirs of pandemic and non-pandemic HIV-1, where they basically show that there are nucleic acids and fecal samples um, in some chimps uh, in Southern Cameroon. Uh, and they basically make the connection between those samples and then modern HIV. Um, there's a chance that Joel Wertheim will be on the call later. And so if he is, I would definitely encourage you to bring up that again, because he could speak to it even better. But in that case, we're able to kind of connect the samples that we have today to samples that we find from chimps. Um, in our case, for our paper, we don't have those same kinds of earlier samples that have a direct connection, um, but we try to use mathematical models to infer a slightly earlier case date or slightly earlier uh, spillover date, perhaps, or at the very least index case state. Super interesting. And, um, you know, what, what I really like about this, this science paper is, is that you're, um, you know, making these inferences about the recent past um, in, in ways that aren't, aren't just sort of like focused on a single moment of origins, um, but looking at, you know, kind of the, the, the false starts and, and the, the ways that, um, you know, viruses that, that might not be as good at, at getting along in a, a human body or transmitting from, from human host to human host. Might might peter out in the population, um, so so maybe if you could just 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 describe the pattern that the data suggests. So so you've you've, you've worked from these genomes. Maybe give, give us a, a characterization of of the body of of evidence with SARS-CoV-2 that you were working from, and then if you could just walk us back to the inferences about um, these 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 strains that seem to have petered out, or may, maybe strain isn't quite the right word, but um, the you know the the lineages or, or clades. Sure. 
So we're using genomes uh, from China, essentially just throughout the pandemic. Um, and when we made, when we first wrote that, that paper, I mean, that was already um, about a year ago. It was like when, roughly when we were writing it uh, prior to our initial submission. And at that time, um, you know, it was less than like a thousand genomes overall. And overwhelmingly, they were just from the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and those genomes really just, they still match with the current data insofar that they bring you to like a most recent common ancestor dating of basically early December, right? Um, the stuff that petered out was much more modeling. And the modeling was uh, using a couple of different, essentially combined models, one of which is called the compartmental model, which is really popular in ecology, as well as um, epidemiology, where you have essentially like susceptible individuals, infected individuals, and then recovered individuals. Those are, that's the most basic model, also called like an SIR model, uh, to abbreviate that, where you go from one category to the next. Um, and we use a slightly more complex model called the Sapphire model, uh, which was pulled from um, another paper that came out uh, pretty early on in the pandemic from a Chinese group where you had susceptible individuals, but then you also had cases that were ascertained or unascertained, basically like did public health authorities see them or did they not see them? Um, and so it was just like a slightly more robust version of that model. And then we're able to take that model and lay it on top of a network and when we lay it on top of a network, um, we are able to figure out some transmission dynamics and then also build phylogenetic trees. And it's using those models that we're able to see that um, these simulations would frequently die out without causing much of, or rather they would frequently end without causing a large epidemic or pandemic, um, suggesting that these viruses often do have kind of like these very, let's just say false starts and then peter out and don't lead to a large thing, a large epidemic. And I mean, that makes obviously total sense just based on regular epi data and what we know about disease transmission. You can get sick and you can transmit to a bunch of people or you can get sick and you can transmit to no one. And we know with SARS-CoV-2, overwhelmingly, most people don't transmit onward. Um, Plenty of people do, of course, but a lot of people don't. And these simulations reflect that, but you have to take that logic and also apply it to the beginning of the pandemic, to spillovers, to index cases, and not just to later on. And there's Joel, even you're muted. Thanks, thanks, Jonathan. I want to also give a, a shout out to uh, Joel Wertheim, who's, who's just now joining us. Um, so Joel, we've we've had some uh, initial conversations about about this paper, um, also about the um, uh, you know there, there's a paragraph in the paper about um, HIV and um, you know the ways that um, it was dated to um, initially southern Cameroon and then it seemed to uh, uh, kind of become the virus that that was a a, a global um, a global epidemic or pandemic after um, you know spending some time in the urbanization um, setting of Kinshasa. Um, so yeah, we're we're just just now um, you know getting into the details of the paper and and one of the things that I really like um, in here is yeah just a, a, a simple statement you know um, the spillover of SARS-CoV-2 like viruses may be fre frequent even if pandemics are rare so part of this paper is is looking at how just subtle differences and um, transmission dynamics amongst viral strains might you know um, be the difference between a, a, a virus that just kind of peters out and one that might engage in some of these initial um, super spreading events um, so, you know, if, if you both could talk a little bit about, um, you know, the dynamics that you seem to be seeing in, in these models and um, the, the sort of differences that you might imagine between a, a failed, at least from the virus's point of view, a, a failed um, crossover event and then this, this lineage that has, has since spread globally. Well, I mean, I think kind of just uh, speaking similarly to 
what I was saying right before Joel hopped on, um, a lot of it has to just do with luck. And that's like what a lot of the simulations show that if you have the lineage or not lineage, if you have the index case and kind of like the right place, right time, that is going to be much more amenable to having pandemic potential, potential than something else. And so for instance, um, if you have someone who has is highly connected in society, regularly sees lots of people, um, they're going to be more likely to spread it onward. But if you have someone living in a very rural area without many connections, they're going to be much less likely to give it on to someone, give it to someone else. Um, that speaks nothing to uh, you know virulence or transmission capacity or capability of a given virus. That just has to do with different societal and network structures. Um, and yeah, I think I'll just stop there and see if Joel wants to add anything. Uh, yeah, so I think there's an important parallel here. Um, when we talk about viral emergence, we can look at viral migration. Um, because, you know, the emergence of SARS-CoV-2, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, it, it happened sort of once, whether it, you know, you multiple spillovers, multiple markets, or a single market, single spillover, it, it's a very short period of time, and you get sort of one chance to take a picture of it. But if we look at, say, the virus coming to the UK or the US, or every new variant emerge, um, we get to see that same pattern. It's not like uh, it's not like Delta arrived on the shores of the US once. It's not like Delta made it into New York City once. These were repeated seeding events and very few of them took hold and some that did eventually sort of give rise to the waves that we see. But um, if you manage to you know, only allow a single introduction of the virus into a geographical region, um, it's, it's you know, probably not going to be um, as successful. I mean, if you just look at sort of, you know, the A lineage that got into Washington state at the beginning of the pandemic, um, that, that, that petered out partly because of mitigation efforts and because susceptible people got infected with a different strain, but one introduction does not necessarily beget um, sort of the, uh, the end, you know, uh, an epidemic. And so there we have multiple measurements and then we go back to zoonosis where we have, you know, far, far, far fewer and we're seeing the same pattern. I think that that's fairly uh, uh, illustrative. Um, Great, thanks. And you know, as as with uh, usual, um, if anyone else has has questions, um, feel free to type them in the chat, raise your hand, or or just just un unmute yourself. Um, one of the things I note from the paper is, you know, you, you say clearly that um, your mathematical models um, aren't able to infer, you know, geographic origin. Um, you're, you're working quite carefully to to try to pinpoint. Um, you know, uh, uh, an emergence of, of the, the strain that, um, that seems to have gone pandemic um, in, in time, e even if place isn't something you're able to directly infer. Um, before uh, uh, we, we started the call today, we, we talked um, a, a little bit in, in the abstract about um, some of the other samples that have, have different timelines um, from some of the wastewater. Um, in, in your paper, you say, um, SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, might be detected in, in archived wastewater samples, and um, you point in particular to, um, you know, new work that might be done in Hubei and, and other parts of China. But I was wondering if either of you might like to speak to other other wastewater samples that have already been um, sequenced else, elsewhere in the world. Yeah, and um, I think a lot of those samplings didn't have enough controls in them. Um, they certainly didn't have enough like negative controls in them. And so when you then look at those positive results, it's hard to ascribe as much validity if you're unable to showcase um, certain more robust sampling methods. Uh, and I think there's a sampling issue, but I also think there's the epidemiology issue where we showed that if you start seeing decent number of cases, especially hospitalizations, you already have a pretty large pandemic on your hands. And 
when there are claims of the virus like starting to come up in samples much earlier on, um, you still don't see this rapid growth of cases or hospitalizations following those early dates, uh, suggesting that those might have not been perhaps like as legitimate as some had previously thought. Uh, whereas, you know, you look straight into China, you start seeing a slow rise, and then you see a pretty meteoric expansion. Um, and that pattern is matched through much of the world after China, uh, which is very in line with what we expect uh, from such an epidemic and such a virus. Uh, Yeah, along those lines, I mean, you get positive samples published, you get positive results published. Now, this is an issue that permeates all of science, but we don't have sort of the, the, the mountains of research of people who went into their local wastewater and didn't find SARS-CoV-2 in November or even, you know, as early as like, you know, spring 2019. Um, yeah, I, I think you need to sort of... Yeah, t t take that into account. Now, there, are, there are also claims in um, in Italy, but that those also suffer from, I think, um, an intense sort of focus on finding early cases. Um, but the, for example, there are the genomes that they pulled out. Um, they seem to have mutations that cropped up in China, but we see them earlier in those Italian samples. So, if you you know that that sort of like if you had to guess, what would a false positive look like? It would look like a March sequence in November, um, which a March 2020 sequence found in Italy in November, which is what they did, which is why I'm still very, um, very skeptical of those results, even, even though they've since published um, additional uh, uh, findings. And the, the notion that, um, I mean, the, the idea that they're all finding them in children, you know, wastewater is a place that you could find it. Um, uh, child, you know, measles surveillance clinic is the, the last place uh, you would expect to find uh, the first cases of COVID-19 in the country. So um, I, 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 think, I think based on sort of, you know, serious investigation into the, the earliest cases um, it makes sense. I mean, you, you've seen claims uh, uh, that CDC antibody study in the U.S. claimed that, what was it, um, I think one and a half 1.4% of their samples were antibody positive in January through March 2020, which would have implied, I think I did the calculation, 7 million cases in the US by March, which is just, I mean, that's not, the, the NIH study that all of us study came back with like, you know, I think was it 0.1 or 0.2% antibody, pos antibody positivity in the, in the first, uh, in that time period, which is, entirely possible, but also consistent with the sensitivity and specificity of their uh, assay. So, you know, one, one odd case in January that we didn't discover, totally possible viral circulation. That's just not, um, I mean, I, it, it, I, I think it's something that a lot of us are coming back to is that, you know, the original story we were all told might just happen to be true. Um, and that, you know, how the virus emerged, like, you know, the, you know, we may debate sort of the, um, the nuances of it, you know, single introduction versus multiple introduction into Washington state, but, you know, in January, in February of 2020. Um, so that all seems, it, it, it all seems to sort of add up. I was wondering if, if you might help us understand, um, you know, the, the idea of uh, the most recent common ancestor kind of as, as, as it's modeled as, as, as a mathematical um, construction and maybe contrast that, you know, what I was trying to tease out with your earlier question about HIV and, and maybe Joel, you, you wanna um, chime in with, I think your, your knowledge of, of that literature um, is, is just the difference between the moment of, um, zoonotic transfer and um, then kind of the amplification of a particular, you know, human adapted uh, version of, of a virus, because often those kind of get conflated and how many people think think about um, these these emergent stories. Um, but one that paragraph in the paper about HIV really helped me wrap my head around the difference between those those two moments. <laughs> 
Sure. So, I mean, the most recent common ancestor is essentially defining um, a relationship among the sequences that you do have, among the genomes that you do have. And if we use, bring in one other idea, um, which is a molecular clock, which is basically just how quickly do we see a given virus evolving, uh, we can start timing those relationships between many different viruses. And when we apply the molecular clock that we're able to basically infer for SARS-CoV-2, we're able to see how far back in time that most recent common ancestor is of all these lineages. And it's an ancestor that would make sense with all these given genomes so that we have today. And so we have that ancestor and its timing uh, just is theoretically plausible when you fold in the rate of evolution of a given virus um, and then see all the subsequent genomes down the line from it, whether they, whether that most recent common ancestor is 50, 60, 70 years away or a year and a half away. Um, Joel, I don't know if you want to add anything to that before we move on to kind of like the difference between the most recent common ancestor and spillover. Yeah, so um, just one other thing about the most recent common ancestor, and this was um, an, an offhand remark that uh, Mark Suchard made to us on a previous project when someone asked to see uh, uh, the mutation tree that we had done the inference on. He, this is all on Zoom, and he was just adding, he said, he said there is no mutation tree. Um, and that's because a program like like Beast, um, that is sort of this, um, I mean, it, it's, it's the workhorse of, you know, molecular phylogenomics, um, and, and even actually, you know, tree time, the next strain uses, it employs a process of the coalescent, which means uh, that you could have identical viruses sampled over a month, you could have 20 viruses, and they're all 100% identical. And you can fit a molecular clock to those viruses using their sampling dates and estimate the time most recent common ancestor. And it won't necessarily be the date of the first sample because even among identical sequences, you have this coalescent process. And the coalescent sort of exists sort of, uh, you know, in, in, in this sort of parallel um, line of sort of research to genetics because Genetics is all based on mutation. You know, molecular evolution genetics is all based on mutation. The coalescent, there's no mutation in the coalescent model. It is just of populations diverging and individuals are giving rise to more individuals. So that's why in, in sort of in in sort of a, a sophisticated molecular clock framework like Beast, there is no there's a mutation model, but really what's happening is population dynamics and sort of realizing that the ancestor exists separate from the mutational process. Um, and, and that sort of helped inform our um, thinking about how you could go back um, before the molecular clock, because what are the processes that happen prior to molecular clock, even irrespective of um, the number of mutations that have occurred. And I can let Jonathan talk about the specifics of that before um, I can just sort of wax a bit about um, HIV and, and my former life. Yeah, I mean, I'll also add just for those who are unfamiliar, whether now or people watch it later, um, a mutation tree is going to be a phylogeny that is scaled in terms of the number of mutations. And accordingly, a time tree is one that is scaled according to time and dates. Uh, and so like a mutation tree with what Joel's describing, where you have a bunch of identical sequences, would just be flat. They would just there would be no divergence. You wouldn't see anything because everything's identical. But that same thing transposed into a time tree would branch out because by definition it needs to. Um, yeah, so I'll just add that. But then to, I guess, do you want to repeat your question for spillover versus TMRCA? Just to remind everyone. Yeah, um, I might get zoom bombed right here by a five year old, but I'll, I'll, I'll try. Um, so, so basically, um, yeah, I, I think, and maybe this is an opportunity to revisit HIV, you know, it seems like the, the conversation is much more settled there in, in terms of, of the evidence, it seems like there was an early event, and it seems like you were able to bring geography together in time to point, pinpoint it in Cameroon, 
And then later on in the 20th century, you see, um, you know, a, a different um, version of, of HIV that's that's um, more amenable to spread amongst humans uh, emerge. Um, so I'd, I'd love to just hear, hear more about, about that also in the context of, um, you know, these models that, that, um, that you all are making about uh, the most recent common ancestor. Yeah, so uh, the, the, the HIV story is, um, is that it, it occurred over a much longer period of time. It's a, uh, you know, th that pandemic took a much longer time to get going. So, and we have a much better idea about the specific location of uh, the host. So HIV, if you just trace back all of the virus circulating today, the greatest amount of diversity for HIV where you're going to find the most subtypes is in uh, the DRC, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and uh, sort of even today, the phylogeography points back to Kinshasa as the um, place where HIV first began to diversify. Um, and that's where, and it, it's believed to be that was part of uh, sort of railroad um, expansion, helped the virus move around that country and eventually uh, to neighboring countries. Uh, and, and that story seems to sit pretty well with our understanding of, of history and of documentation in uh, the middle of the 20th century of the virus uh, there in the infected people uh, where they've recovered fragments of the viral genome are now uh, almost, uh, uh, almost a complete viral genome from uh, the DRC. But uh, there are lots of chimpanzees all over uh, Central Africa and many of those populations are infected with their own version of the simian immunodeficiency virus. Um, and the population of chimps that has the virus most closely related to HIV-1 group M, that HIV virus that went pandemic, uh, of course, HIV has spilled over into humans over a dozen times, but only one of them uh, is sort of what most people who are infected with uh, this virus that they have. Uh, they live in Southeast Cameroon, which isn't that far from uh, uh, what was then Zaire, but it is not Zaire. Um, and of course, this makes sense because the origin was, you know, you expect to be the cut hunter hypothesis where while butchering a chimpanzee, you're exposed to blood. And if that, if you have a cut and blood on blood contact, you can uh, become infected. And that's sort of our best idea of how this, how that virus got into humans. Um, but that's not where we see it emerge. Uh, chimps in in what's now the DRC have very, very different viruses. Um, and it's not just like, oh, it's from Cameroon, it's from this particular part in Cameroon where you have sort of chimp populations separated by rivers. So they're probably not um, moving around a, a whole lot, which means that someone got the virus at some point and then it took but we have no idea how long it took because we don't have a good model of um, sexual transmission um, in pre-colonial sub-Saharan Africa for a, a virus like HIV. So we, we can't go and um, Jonathan can't go do his, his favorites magic um, in there because he just, it, it's a really hard model to parameterize. I'm sure you could get a bound on it, but it'd be pretty rough. Um, but we know that it likely transmitted for, you know, some period of time. And of course, you know, HIV can stick around for quite a long period of time before, um, before, you know, you need to trend before somebody needs to transmit. So it probably just circulated among a small group of individuals until one of them migrated to, uh, uh, what was then say year. And, uh, you get sort of that expansion. So when we talk about, you know, the ancestor of HIV, we really talk about the age of HIV diversity, not the zoonosis. And of course, this is something that is just constantly conflated in, in all sort of literature. I'm sure I, I haven't gone back to reread any of my papers on this, but I'm, I'm sure I've made that mistake as well. It's just sort of this default because in general, they were going to be about the same thing. If you look at the, you know, the 2014-15 West African Ebola outbreak, your, your TMRCA is probably very, very close to your zoonotic spillover event. Um, and that probably doesn't make a difference about trying to understand sort of where it came from. For SARS-CoV-2, you know, those days, weeks, and months, and those estimates, you know, really matter. And because we had such sort of good data on sort of how, and a good model of how the virus transmitted in Ube, we could, uh, we could really narrow that down to a pretty tight uh, prior expectation of how long it could have circulated. <laughs> 
Thanks much. That's that's super helpful. Um, I, I also want to dig in a little bit to, um, I, I guess it's a, a, a preprint that you've offered us, um, evidence against the veracity of SARS-CoV-2 genomes intermediate between lineages A and B. Um, it, it's a paper that both of uh, you, uh, Joel and Jonathan are on, as well as Christian Anderson and other colleagues. Um, and, you know, for the non-specialist, um, maybe if you could just start by offering some background about lineages A and B, um, and, and maybe talk about kind of the state of play of, of knowledge. I mean, one, one fragment of information I picked up from the WHO report, or at least the media accounts of that report, were, I, I believe, 13 different genotypes found, found very early in, in um, Hubei. So how, how do those, those different genotypes um, that, you know, that we have from those very early days map onto these different lineages? How does sequencing error play, play into um, our interpretations here? And you know, what's, what are your latest thoughts about um, you know, the different, different varieties of this virus we see um, in the earliest of samples? So I guess to start um, pretty much almost immediately in the pandemic, uh, the virus appeared in with two different lineages, lineage A and lineage B, and they are separated just by two substitutions at uh, two sites, 8782 and 2844. Lineage B has a C at 8782 and a T at 2144, and lineage A has the opposite, a T at 8782 and a C at 2144. Um, as it relates to the WHO report, so right, there are 13 genomes there, uh, there are 13 cases. 12 out of 13 of those are lineage B, and then one out of those 13 is lineage A. Um, there was like slight mislabeling error in that report, and we've had to kind of like go through and make sh kind of realign uh, which sequence belongs to which person and so on. Um, but that still remain like all those facts still remain true. Um, there isn't like a fitness difference, for, generally speaking, between those two lineages, as far as we know. There was like one paper early on that suggested there might be, but we haven't really seen that play out in a more practical way. Um, so there are really just two, you know, what we could call clades or lineages. They're separated by two mutations. Um, and one of the questions is, did it start with one and then go to the other? Or uh, did it start in the middle or something else entirely? And importantly, lineage B was sampled first. The earliest samples are lineage B. Lineage A was sampled slightly later. Um, but lineage A is theoretically closer to some of the bat genomes we have. Those two sites um, match bat genomes a little bit better than lineage B. However, we also know that by in SARS-CoV-2, we have much higher rates of um, a substitution from C to T as opposed to the opposite direction. So there's some, that is some other information that we're like incorporating in our models now. Um, we also know that there are environmental samples, um, and environmental samples have all been lineage B so far. Um, that also plays into some of the conversations that we're having. Um, but in talking about transition from lineage A to lineage B or vice versa, you would need that intermediate sequence. And we see genomes with a C at both sites and a T at both sites. And if we look specifically early on in the pandemic, as opposed to later on, because you know, with millions of people infected or, and then millions of genomes sampled, you're going to start seeing lots of mutations. So we have to focus early in the pandemic because an intermediate genome sampled in 2021 doesn't tell us anything about the transition from lineage A to B or vice versa early in the pandemic. So we have to focus on those earliest genomes. And if we then start looking, especially at the CC genomes, the C at both 8782 and 2844, um, we start seeing what we call homoplasies. Uh, they're not necessarily real homoplasies, but basically if you look at CC genomes and then you look at lineage B genomes or lineage A genomes, 
genomes, you will sometimes see the same mutations or substitutions, right? Which means that those substitutions happen twice. And we see a lot of occurrences of that, a bunch of those substitutions happening on both CC genomes or allegedly CC genomes, and then also lineage B or lineage A genomes. We see so many of those that it's starting, that we basically started to think that those CC genomes might actually just not be real. They're probably lineage B or lineage A genomes, but perhaps because of sequencing error or bioinformatics error more likely that um, it was being incorrectly called at one of those sites and leading to that genome, that, that consensus genome that we see that on like a database. But that doesn't mean that's actually the correct genome. Um, that was very, very true for CC genomes. And we thought that was true for the TT genomes as well. But uh, on further inspection, uh, there, if you look at a small outbreak in the Diamond Princess, right, where um, you have very specific defining mutations that are just seen on Diamond Princess early on, you see a genome that has a T at both sites. And when you then look at that data, which fortunately uh, those papers from uh, the authors, from the Japanese authors uh, for the Diamond Princess papers, um, they, they show that. They show that uh, those TT genomes are, appear to be correctly called. They overwhelmingly show T at both sites, like when along all the read data from the sequencing, suggesting that those TT genomes are real. That doesn't mean all the TT genomes are real, but the ones in Diamond Princess certainly appear real. However, that also means that's not a transitional genome between lineage A and lineage B. That is just the TT genome that arose later from a lineage B sequence, right? As uh, Joel called it in some of our earlier conversations, um, it was evolution in a bottle, right? We saw a bunch of infection, a bunch of transmission, and then some evolution on those on the diamond princess. And you saw it go from lineage B to having a TT genome. It's still lineage B though. It arose from lineage B, right? And therefore it's not what we're looking for necessarily in terms of going from A to B all the way at the beginning of the pandemic showcasing the development of the opposing lineage from the get-go. Thank you. Lots of complexities here. Um, and I think I understand, you know, sequencing errors and how that can happen, but I, I guess I'm less familiar with the bioinformatics errors. Are you just talking about alignments or? Um... So in, in this case, especially in the very beginning, you have your H1 reference genome. That's and, a lineage genome. Yeah, and that's, and, that's, and that's sort of this, that was the first genome that was published. Um, and when you sequence SARS-CoV-2, you don't just sort of go in and naively try and guess, you know, what's this coronavirus and what's not. You you have your reference genome and you basically take all your sequences and you, you know, align them against that. And you're calling bases in reference to that genome. So in that sense, even though it was the first one, it's actually very important from a bioinformatics uh, perspective. Now, there was a tendency, especially in the early days, um, is that if you didn't have really good coverage at a site, like, you know, you only had one, you know, stray sequence for that instead of, you know, the, the thousand or 5,000 that you would really like. Um, and maybe they disagreed and it was unclear, or you just had nothing sequenced there at all. You'd be like, okay, I don't know what that is. Let's just, let's just put in the reference genome there and just call that a day. Because especially these sequences mostly differed by only a handful of mutations anyway. So if you were unclear about a handful of sites, well, they're probably just the reference. And that was sort of a bioinformatics decision that was made. And as a result, you can have really good information for a C in one position and no information for T or C in the other. So you just call it the reference, which happened to be C. And all of a sudden you have a CC genome where most likely 
uh, if this was a lineage A sequence, it would be a TC genome. But because you couldn't differentiate between T and C, you just say, yeah, it's the reference, which I, I don't mean to, you know, second guess uh, the calling of SARS-CoV-2 genome, uh, you know, during the first wave of the pandemic in China. Um, but now that we're going back and looking, you know, very sort of carefully at these genomes, um, sort of one mutation differences uh, can may matter a lot. And I think that's like really in line with, especially early in the pandemic, we always talked about how slow SARS-CoV-2 evolves, which isn't necessarily wrong, but if you apply that logic across the board, there will sometimes be consequences to that that aren't ideal, and this is one of them. Not that the choice they made was wrong, but it led to this consequence, and now looking back at it, we're seeing that there are some discrepancies in the data that we had to figure out. Super interesting. Um, I, I might call on Stephen since um, you're more of an expert than me here. To, to I mean, are, are there questions that you want to ask of, of this this preprint or 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 also the science paper, which I know you're a huge fan on? I don't I don't know if I have questions. I mean, I've been enjoying listening to the answers to the. I feel like you've been asking the right questions. Um, of both of these guys. Uh, yeah, I'm just kind of enjoying being along for the ride. You can call on me if you think there's anything <laughs> that I can be helpful with. Either, either or either Jonathan or Joel can call on me, but I think you've been asking all the right questions. Well, um, okay. I, I, I feel um, uh, less, less like an amateur then, but um, I still feel something like an amateur and, and reloper. Um, it, maybe just a, a, a question about the methods here in, in, in this preprint. So you excluded the animal samples, i.e. bat and pangolin, along with um, any sequences that had an incompletion, incomplete collection date. Um, and I was just wondering about that choice to exclude the, the animal samples and what including those might reveal differently about, about these stories. I mean, the animal samples are all incredibly diverged. They are not necessarily telling us a ton about what happened in those first two weeks post spillover. And this and preprint- just, just to clarify, so you mentioned environmental samples and then are, are the an animal samples, would those be like um, RATG13 or you're talking about yeah. Okay, right. For animal samples, we're specifically talking about samples pulled from bats and penguins. Environmental samples are samples pulled from uh, the Huanan market. Uh, there's just a handful of them, um, and they're all lineage B genomes. They, they all map like align well, generally, with the human data. Um, so I wouldn't, those are not animal samples. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So we choose to, chose to exclude those because we could do other investigations on the relationship between genomes from bats and pangolins compared to humans. That's its own question, but uh, that isn't necessarily the question of like, do transitional genomes exist, right? It's just, a, it would just be a different question. Okay, yeah, yeah that, that totally makes sense. I mean, those they're basically different, you know, totally different viruses, the um, RITG yeah. and, and, and others. Um, super interesting. Uh, and I'll just add, uh, if you're interested, the reason we excluded stuff without complete collection dates, that's because uh, there are sometimes mistaken calls to collection, to people sometimes wrote down the wrong dates for when they collected their samples. And it would be like, it should have been 2020, or sorry, a sequence should have been labeled 2021, but when things were just being uploaded in bulk, they just auto labeled them 2020. Uh, and that throws things off. And also if you like, you know, don't put the month on it, or sorry, the day on it, it's hard to know exactly if it should have fallen into our window. And then if you don't put the month on it, I mean, then it's just much harder to trust overall as to when exactly it happened. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and one other question, we're almost at the witching hour here, but um, just, just to understand um, in, you know, what, what these, um, these samples are in, in relation to the actual, like what, what the um, sequencing data are in, in relation to the viruses in, in an organism. I've, I've heard some reporting that in a given person, you're gonna have multiple genotypes circulating, but then, then you also just said that um, assumptions about SARS-CoV-2 are, are that it's um, slowly evolving. So there's consensus genomes that I guess are, are integrating an average, uh, like of all the viral diversity that a given individual might have, a consensus genome is, is trying to come up with, you know, something in the middle of, of let's call it a viral swarm. Um, so that's maybe just about the sequencing. And then just, I'd love to hear you say more about why um, SARS-CoV-2 is thought to be slowly evolving. So, I mean, there is intrahost variation, right? But overwhelmingly, when you look at the intrahost variation, it's like a few percentage points out of 100 of diversity that you see at a few sites. Um, and generally, when you have onward transmission, your onward transmission is from the overwhelming majority, right? And the consensus, consensus genome is generally the overwhelming majority. You know, of course, certain sites, like if it evolves and it gets a little bit different, usually you still see migration toward like a majority within a given individual. Um, but as it relates to the bioinformatics stuff that we're talking about, when you sequence someone's genome, right, you get lots of reads of, or lots of like little fragments across the genome and you, those match up through an algorithm. Um, and then if you look at a given site, you know, you might have a given site in the genome called, you know, maybe 20 times, maybe a few thousand times, the more the better. Um, but when you own, when you have like not necessarily the best sequencing and you only have a given site called, let's say three times, your algorithm or your bioinformatics protocol might be like, well, it's called only, we only see that site three times in the read data. So we're just going to call the reference. We need a minimum of 10 reads for every, for every site to be able to call it based on the read data or the sequencing data, as opposed to calling the reference. So that has much less to do with intrahost variation and more to do with just the way that you are representing uh, your read data and calling your, or making a consensus genome. Mm -hmm. And, and then on SARS-CoV-2 being slowly evolving, I, I understand that, you know, it's got the proofreading um, capabilities, um, but yeah, how, how, is, how is that playing out as, as, you know, more information is coming out about how this is changing over time? I mean, slow relative to other RNA viruses. Um, uh, so it, I mean, yeah, it's not as fast as HIV or e Ebola, um, but of course it has a much longer genome, three times as big as HIV and one and a half times the length of Ebola. So um, we, we can still, and now that we're sequencing the whole genome, it really gives us the opportunity uh, to see all of the mutations and the, the shift towards you know, full genome sequencing um, can't be understated in helping us understand uh, the dynamics of spread of this virus. So even though it's a little bit slower than other RNA viruses, um, the more you sequence, uh, the more you can see. Great, thanks. Well, thanks thanks to both of you. Um, really lovely to have you back, uh, Stephen. And I'm you know, really curious to watch the conversation in this space. It, it'll be interesting in the coming months, I think years and decades, you know, like with HIV, as, as new, um, you know, archive samples get discovered and get sequenced, I, I think um, it, it'll be interesting to see how, how the picture changes or, or stays the same. Um, but, but thank you so much, especially for sharing this work in progress. And um, yeah, re really good to see you, Jonathan and, and, and Joel. I, I hope to continue the conversation. So uh, thanks everybody. And um, uh, yeah, maybe see you in a Zoom room sometime soon. Thanks for having me. Okay, cheers. Bye. Bye, thanks. Bye.